I don't know where Rockus comes out from with these songs, but I am telling you, Sapadilla, something about Sapadilla and banana. Is the banana going into the Sapadilla? What? I don't it's know. I'm asking. Is he talking about the market? Vendor? All right. All right. It's just about 22 minutes after the hour of 7 o'clock. It's the Now Morning Show here on TTT. I am Natalie Lagore. And it's time for a segment that has you all, the segment that has you all excited, your body and you, where we learn about our various body parts, how to use them. Uh, some of us are very good with that, and then others of us, we just don't know enough. And, and I think I fall into that category this morning. We're going to be speaking with uh, urologist Dr. Lilas. Good morning to you, Dr. Lilas. Good morning, Natalie. Welcome to the Now Morning Show. Thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic. So, urology, tell us what that is about. Well, urology is a subspecialty within the surgical field that deals with the urinary tract in male and females, and of course, the reproductive system in men. So, hence, penis comes over under our remit. Right. And, and that's what we want to focus about this morning. Because my knowledge of the penis is, I'd say, about 5%. Yeah. So, so, what is the penis? That's the first thing. Because I don't know if there's a definition. We had Dr. Pottinger, and I literally had to get a definition for the vagina. What is the penis? The, the penis is an organ or phallus that is use both in as a conduit in men of course uh, for the urinary tract passing urine and it's of, of course used in the other function of procreation or recreation um, it's a it's an organ that does dual roles really yeah so it is actually an organ it is an organ in itself but it's part of the genital urinary system and it it serves two main roles as I indicated we should look at form and function so the function of the penis essentially is as a conduit is of urine but it's also used commonly in in intercourse of course so all right but well let's talk about that because i think we know about the the urinary tract and and peeing but somehow we have these taboos around talking about the penis or the vagina when we're talking about using them for recreation or even procreation. What are some of the benefits of having that penis being used for intercourse, for procreation, for recreation? Benefits. You have a fantastic time, I suppose. Well, I mean, the benefits. If the penis can affect your urinary tract, because urine comes through the penis and but mostly we are consulted because of sexual issues related to the penis so they're quite separate but still integrated um, of course there are physical problems of the penis that men would present with simple things like the tight foreskin phimosis the bent penis on erection um, and of course the penis can also suffer trauma as a result of intercourse there's, there's the concept of a fractured penis, which mm. I know is, it's not quite a bone, but you can fracture the tissue. Oh, the do you fracture a penis during sex? Right. Um, well, it's a bit delicate, it's a bit early, but it's positional, and um, a misdirected thrust can result in a fractured penis. But luckily, we recognize it, and we can repair it successfully. Oh. But overwhelmingly, the the main reason men pitch up about their penis, that is, let's say, older men, it relates to its function and erectile dysfunction, the inability to get or maintain a sufficient, an erection sufficient for intercourse. No, Doc, I have to tell you, normally when we're in studio and having these interviews, people would be on their phones, but I notice all the men are standing at attention. Sure, sure. And that's not being a, a cliche. All the men are standing at attention, listening to what you're saying, because I think we all want to learn about the penis. But talk to us about erectile dysfunction. W how does that come about? What are the causes? Right. I, that's quite a broad topic, but in, in just as a broad overview, um, getting an erection is a rather complex process. 
Um, it, it begins with some form of signaling, neuronal or nerve signaling. You must have an adequate blood supply because ultimately an erection is literally a blood supply issue. Blood is shunted into the penis. It has to be trapped in the penis and then it has to be let out. So any impairment to that mechanism can result in erectile dysfunction. Um, and there are numerous things that can cause blood not to be flowing properly in the body. Absolutely. But on its broadest concept, we, we consider erectile dysfunction as organic or psychological because there may be... Psychological. Yes, you can certainly, and that certainly happens in mainly younger men, a sudden loss of erections. Now, if you're 25 and you're physically fit, it's unlikely that you have an organic problem. So why have you lost your erections? So we need to separate that at the start. But overwhelmingly, uh, gentlemen who present for treatment, we would discover that there's an organic problem um, related to blood flow, re related to the hormonal status, related to the nerve supply. Um, thankfully, the, the treatment options for erectile dysfunction has changed significantly in the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So what we could offer men 10, 20 years ago is, is quite different. So there's, there's a lot of hope. The other important bit about erections that we now appreciate, and my cardiology colleagues would know this, that it is it's a marker for general health. It's somewhat oh. like the canary in the coal mine. So if you're able to get that erection without any problem, it's suggesting that the other parts of the body are in good health. In, in, in a broad sense, but looking at it the other way, if you are suffering with organic erectile dysfunction, this may implicate other organ systems within the body. And it's, it's been proven in studies that the onset of erectile dysfunction may predate you knowing about cardiovascular di disorders. Because we're talking about circulation of blood Absolutely. in the body. Mm -hmm. So in terms of general advice we give to men, if you adopt a heart healthy diet and activity, usually that's good for the penis as well. So um, erectile dysfunction is not just a fad, but it, it can indicate the onset of significant disorders. One of the things uh, we're curious about as well is the difference between a circumcised and an uncircumcised penis. And are there any benefits to being circumcised? Well, there certainly is. Um, there is, well, there are infections that you can get associated with a tight foreskin, and that's unheard of with circumcision. Um, it also reduces the chance of getting penile cancer. There is although it's rare, but it's almost unheard of having penile cancer if you've been circumcised at an early stage. So, but of course, circumcision is also tied up in socio-cultural, religious things. So it's, it's, it's not that it's good or bad, um, but there are certainly benefits to having a circumcision. And what of infections? Are they less contagious when we're circumcised? Well, yes, there, there seems to be some evidence that, particularly HIV, um, and this has been instituted and in practiced in sub-Saharan Africa, where the actual incidence and prevalence of HIV was reduced by having a circumcision. There, it seems to be a, a fairly easy or a, a more amenable transmission site if you have that foreskin. Mm -hmm. But there are other factors, of course. So it's beneficial, certainly beneficial from that point of view. And, and Doc, when we think of infections, uh, somehow we always think of the vagina when we're talking about sexually transmitted infections. But uh, talk to us about infections with the penis. What are some of the signs and symptoms? What can men look out for? Right. So let's separate it. They're, they're standard infections of the penis, which usually relate to the foreskin. And if you have an overly tight foreskin, you can get what we call balanitis, inflammation of the, the head of the penis and of the foreskin, and that's easily treated with circumcision. But of course, the penis is also involved in intercourse, and it can 
It can indicate if you've got a sexually transmitted infection, and that usually relates to the tube that runs within the penis. So if you have symptoms such as burning when passing urine, a discharge that is not urine or semen of unknown origin that came on suddenly, that could indicate a sexually transmitted infection. So, I mean, it, it's not that the penis is infected, but the actual insides and the tubular system is infected. So it, there's a bit of a difference there. It, it, are women more prone to infections is something I always ask, because somehow he in a relationship, somehow the man always believes, okay, the woman has an infection and I'm good. No, it, 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 it works both ways, and we take it two hands to clap. And usually, if I would see someone with a man with a sexually transmitted infection, I would certainly ask about his partner and, and suggest that they would be treated or checked at the same time. Um, so it, because you can have this back and forth. So men and women get slightly different infections and the mechanism is different, but it would be, it would be foolhardy to treat the man in isolation. All right, Doc, I, I am definitely learning some things here. One of the major things that I've learned so far is that an erectile dysfunction can be caused from a psychological thing and not necessarily an organic thing. I Absolutely. thought all of them were organic, yeah. but now we know that men can get into their own heads and be their worst enemies, so to speak. Absolutely. Right. In, in, in previous times, we thought it was mostly psychological. Um, that has certainly changed, um, but we do see Lots of men, usually younger men, usually with a short history, suddenly losing your erections. And it, you get into it, and it's usually a psychological basis. So, but they hope for, for both psychological and organic treatment of erectile dysfunction. Right. And uh, how, how do you care for the penis? I mean, you say it's an organ. What do you do to care for it, to take care of it? Well, there's no specific treatment, but it, it's part of your general treatment and hygiene. Of course, the penis is quite resilient because we subject it um, to a fair amount of unnecessary trauma. We don't... Is that through sex? Well, uh, yes, it can be traumatized through sex, but of course but, but it's no designed... But no man believes that though, Doc. Look, look at Rock is turning and like, yeah. something wrong with you? Yeah. Uh, you know? Uh, Oh, I, the I so, saw the face. Uh, when you turn up in the emergency room with a fractured penis or torn frenulum or a persistent erection that can't come down, well, you know, That's it, can, it can be But that does not happen? It certainly can happen. Um, in our setting, of course, we have a fair amount of people with sickle cell disease and um, one of, the, one of the, the markers of sickle cell disease is that they can have priapism, which is a prolonged erection, usually lasting more than four hours. And of course, men may be thinking, that's a fantastic idea. But of course, if the penis stays erect for that length of time, it can become deoxygenated. And when it eventually goes down, you have a very, very difficult case of erectile getting dysfunction, it getting it back. And yeah we get into the zone of penile prosthesis and stuff. So it's not a good idea, an erection lasting, let's say, an hour. I mean, in social let's media. Let's talk about that, because men like to believe that they are men, Absolutely. only if they're having sex for an hour or more. How long should that penis be engaged in sexual activity for each bout of sexual activity that's taking right. place? Well, this is tied up with pornography and stuff like that. But I tell men, that's not normal. Pornography, that's, they usually cut, there's drugs, there's vacuum devices. So men get a skewed view of what a normal erection and duration. On average, the average intercourse where and duration of an erection is somewhere about eight to 10 minutes. So you may hear in popular <laughs> culture about Doc. You know, on the saddle for Doc, an hour, two hours. You just pause. Rock us. Eight yeah. to ten minutes. Is that sufficient for you? Yeah, man. Loot and fire. Eight to ten minutes. That's good. And again. And again. Nicholas. <laughs> Nicholas says two minutes. Absolutely. Harry. Eight to ten minutes. Good for you. Carrie says no. No. Well, actually, the data, the raw data suggests that is more than adequate. 
And most men who come out with these stories of an hour and two hours, those are just stories. Oh! Absolutely. So, Doc, are you suggesting they're lying? Yes. Uh, yeah. Maybe stretching the truth a bit, but <laughs> it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say <laughs> they're lying. Diplomatic. Yeah, <laughs> Doc said they're just stretching the truth stretching a bit. The truth. <laughs> All right. Oh, God. So, Doc, so eight to ten minutes, uh, that's how long the penis is supposed to be in an erected state in, for. That's, that's the average time. Now, you can certainly go longer than that, but the expectation that you should go half an hour or 45 minutes is absolutely misconstrued. And, and okay, and uh, how many times are, are, are men allowed to have that eight to 10 minutes in a day? How, what's considered normal? Is, it, is there any limit? Or there, is no, there is no limit. Um, and it's actually healthy for the penis because the erect state, there's what we consider oxygenated blood going to the penis and in fact men get five to six erections overnight it's a, the body's form of oxygenating the penis the erection we may notice the morning erection that is the last of maybe five or six erections so if you get up in the morning and there's no erection you should run to the doctor that is one of the markers we look for have you lost morning or nocturnal erections well, I haven't had an erection in the morning for, for ages. That's usually a bad sign. Is there an age limit, though? I know people say as you get older, you might not have that morning erection. Is that a myth? Well, it all, it's all tied into your general health. I certainly have men in their 80s and 90s with healthy erections. Um, so it, it, you cannot de-link it from your general health. That's why we say it's a marker for your overall health. Right. All right, Doc, we have to leave it there, but you'll be back next week. I know you didn't know this, but I'm just telling you. <laughs> well, I'm usually called to talk about the prostate, which is the... We the, will explore that next course, week, Doc, because it is an issue here in Trinidad and Tobago, prostate cancer and across the Caribbean and across the, the, the world, men having prostate cancer. Dr. Lilas, thank you so much for talking with us this morning. Thank you very much. Dr. Lilas, their urologist, talking to us about the penis. And one of the things that you have to realize is that 8 to 10 minutes is sufficient. That's good. These one-hour stories that you'll be throwing out there. Well, we take that